Hey Dave from Linus k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And we're here with the executive producer, Hawk. And she's in a good mood today. She wanted to say hi to everybody. And she's been playing. There she goes, she's had enough. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you what, this dog is unbelievable for a multitude of reasons. But let me tell you that. The easy one is uh, we've had a, quite a cold spell here in northern Montana. It's been in the uh, at night. It's been into the single digits, and during the day it only got up to I think 16 today. So you take Huck outside, and uh, these Pyrenees just love the cold. The colder it is, the better. And uh, I think she'd stay out all night, and she would love it. She lays down in the snow. She goes along, kind of makes tracks in the snow with her nose. It's bizarre. I've never seen a dog like it, but she has a lot of fun. And uh, we make snowballs, toss them to her. She'll catch them, run with them. Uh, yeah, some of you have realized that uh, she is very good for me. And uh, we are very, very tight. And I'm blessed that she's in my life. It's helped me a lot. And uh, there was a time there where Angie said, you know, Dave, we need to go get a dog. I think it would help you. And uh, mental health wise, it's helped me a lot. So if you're considering getting a dog, there's a lot of rescue dogs that need a lot of love. And those rescue dogs, return the love ten times over because it's like they know nobody wanted them and then you came along and you got them so take a walk through a shelter someday and you'll see what I mean on the mental health side there's been some talk in the news just recently especially in New York about forced incarceration for some people with severe mental health issues. And uh, when I was a policeman, I gotta admit that uh, I put a lot of people on forced mental health holds. And a lot of times it was the family calling up and they didn't have anything, they didn't have alternatives and the family, the other family member was being threatening to the family and you couldn't leave them alone. And uh, I had to bring them to mental health. It's a system that just doesn't, has never worked right. And it's probably because we don't have the resources to really take the time to figure out what each person's deep issue is and then to work with them for months to get them to maybe come around. If there is one part of our world that needs help, it's mental health. And uh, I've said before, and I'll say it again, if there's one agency that has really stepped up and uh, they have my full support, it's NAMI, N-A-M-I, and I encourage you to, to get to them if you or a family member need some assistance. So, so that's my mental health chat for today. And I, I, I heard today or the other day that uh, New York was thinking about forcibly incarcerating mental health individuals. And I understand. I mean, there's some people with mental health in these big cities that are extremely violent. And they've got to be off the streets. And it can't be a revolving door because they're a danger to society. So maybe they could get some help. Friends, Missing 411, the UFO connection. Had some people lately tell me that Dave, that have seen it just once, Dave, we've got to see this thing again. In fact, I know I'm going to want to watch it two or three times. And the common denominator is, is that people say it's content rich. Uh, you didn't, you didn't pull in a, put in a lot of fluff. You didn't put in a lot of B-roll. This is all original kind of stuff. And 
to really understand the message that you're saying. I need to see it again. So that time's coming. You can pre-order the movie if you want to watch it online. You can pre-order it now. And uh, I think there's five different platforms where you can pre-order. And if you look right below this video, under the pinned comments, that's the number one comment, you're going to see the connections. If you want to get a DVD or Blu-ray, get it from me. And it's on our online store, NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. Go to the store, you'll see it there. And then uh, do not, please, please do not buy my books on Amazon, eBay, etc. You're going to get ripped off by resellers that are charging four or five times what I charge for the books. Yeah, please don't. I don't want to see you get ripped. So on to the letter section. This is a missing person segment. I've got three cases I'm going to talk to you about. And here we go. Hey Dave, good evening. I really enjoyed watching the Bigfoot Class 101 series that you recently made. To that end, I think we're up to segment or class 9 or 10. I forgot. But uh, it's content rich. It's uh, about 8 hours of total view time to get to that level. I've been a fan for a while. Thank you for your dedication. It's such a wonderful way for me to calm the nerves down after a day of hard work. It feels so free and magical to forget about bills and all the other heavy real world issues just let the curiosity take charge and lead me to wherever i want to go ka-ching sometimes we need that escape and uh other people say well dave the topic's too heavy i just can't i just can't imagine it i get that too and uh but what i tell people is before you come in and sit down for the video. Go flush the toilet, meaning flush your head. Get rid of all the peripheral things. Just focus. And uh, one of the things I've told people is, in fact, I know probably a hundred people that have all four of our maps on their walls in their office, and they look at them daily, just like I do. And one of these days, we're gonna have an epiphany. And that epiphany, just so you know, one of them happens in the movie. That's all I'll say. While well, watching the series, I couldn't help think about the hitchhiker phenomena you mentioned before. I have a theory on my own about that. For starters, I feel like for every animal species, their perception of the world is some degree limited, aka finite. For example, as humans, we can he clearly hear sounds between 20 and 20,000 hertz, while dogs can hear sounds up to 45,000 hertz. We are only able to see a small section of the electromagnetic spectrum that we call visible light. While a mantis shrimp can see more colors than we do, we simply do not know what the world is like beyond our perception. <laughs> I learned about this when I was young. I was, I was raised with a pool in my backyard and I loved the water and I was a good swimmer. And so I asked my dad when I was 12 if I could take scuba diving lessons. And we lived like three blocks from De Anza College in Cupertino. And my dad said, okay, you find the class that'll let you in and I'll let you go. And I think I was 14 and now NAUI had a class that they were sponsoring at De Anza. And I rode my bike over there uh, twice a week for I think 16 weeks. It's one of the most fun things I ever did. And that gave me a lifetime of enjoyment. Uh, I've always loved diving. Well, one of the things you learn is that the deeper you go in the water, you lose certain colors as you go down. Just like this person said, well, you, you can't see certain colors like animals can't. Well, in the water, the deeper you go, you, lure, you lose colors. And yeah, I got sidetracked there. Back to the letter. This summer I went to the beach to swim and picked up some fish and crab bones on my way back. They are usually scattered all over the place following a storm. My neighbor wanted fish bones as fertilizer for his plant. You know what I mean as growing them is now legal in Canada? The fish bones were totally dried up in my opinion, not a speck of flesh was left. However, I had flies following me the entire way home. 
Even after my neighbor buried them in his planter, flies were still able to detect what was underneath the soil. They clearly have a way better senses of detecting rotting flesh than we do. We can see them land on the dead fish when they come. And because they fly so fast, faster than our eyes can track, when they take off, they are just completely gone. We have no idea where they went. Then it hit me. It's such a good analogy of the hitchhiker phenomenon about Bigfoot. They can follow us around. For what purpose, I'm not sure, though. Also, have the ability to come in and out of our perception in an instant, as if they jumped dimensions. They are elusive, hard, to, hard or impossible to catch because they can dodge our biological radar. Just like flies. Those who deny their existence are also denying the fact that our perception is finite. Anyway, just a little after shower thought. I know you are busy and don't want to keep you on one email too long. Have a good week. We're very lucky to have you. No, 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 no. No, no, no. I'm very lucky to have you guys. And I know that. That's called gratitude, and I have a lot of it for everything I have, including my friends that are watching this right now. Thank you, villagers. Next video. Hey, Dave, I've been a fan from the beginning of your YouTube venture and have never missed a video. Wow. It's about 400 right now. While listening to you, you said, quote, I have spent hours and hours looking into space. That's a fact. I can think of dozens of times I went backpacking uh, with friends and we laid on our back and we talked about space, looked into space and saw UFOs one time. Looking for the UFO I know is always out there, sometimes driving my friends and family crazy with my obsession until the night I saw what I had been looking for. I owned and operated a small business in the Central Valley of California for 30 years. Worked long hours, made deliveries to customers. And one night, I saw it. I was driving an unusually bright light in the sky. And I saw it for a long period of time. I don't know what it was. I'm not sure. And I don't want to say. But it was something unusual. Just like you, I've always wanted to see more. And I haven't. I've talked to people before and they try to dismiss what I've seen. That's okay. I know what it was. I know it wasn't normal. I know it was too bright in the sky. And I know that it probably was not a plane, a helicopter, or anything like a satellite. I've told my family and a few others, but I kind of keep it to myself. Over the years, I've realized that it's not anything man-made. I was very lucky. I know what I saw. Just like you, I hope to see more. I keep my interest going. Keep up the great work. You are appreciated. So when somebody says I saw a UFO, people think, oh, you know, what are they implying? No, just a UFO is unidentified, unidentified flying object. It could be anything. How many things can you identify in the sky? Yeah, I can't identify many. Next one. Hey, Dave. I find the reader letters just as fascinating as the missing person cases. If everyone would speak up about their own experiences, we would certainly find out that those are much more common than we are led to believe. I'm from Luxembourg. My father passed away in December 2020 due to alcohol abuse. After his passing, a couple of strange events occurred. This isn't uncommon either. My grand cousin had a dream about him telling her to watch after me. When she related her dream to me, she described my father in great detail, including his tie and jacket. Could have been just a random dream, but I think there was more to it. She only saw him once, when she was real young. During the time he was in ICU, I took care of his cabin. I cleaned it up and fed the cat. His cat is now living at my place. The first day I left his bedroom window open to air out the room. The window had a friction mechanism that prevented it from closing, as it was old too it got pretty difficult to open and close one had to push pretty hard when i came back the next day the window was closed all the way but not latched this baffled me quite a bit as it was almost impossible in the weeks after his passing it was my job to decide what to do with his possessions during one stormy night thieves smashed the same bedroom window and looted the place they stole quite a bit of his possessions 
This was not a bad neighborhood and his car was still parked in the driveway. Plus we had erected a new fence one year prior with security lights. I thought it might have been him closing the window as some form of warning. I don't think time is linear in the astral space. He might have seen what was about to play out and tried to give me a heads up, something I clearly wasn't able to figure out. P.S. I always loan a sat phone when I go I always loan a sat phone when I go out on vacation to sparsely populated areas to do photography. After hearing your advice, I think a PLB might be a better choice. Sat reception is usually pretty poor unless you are in a clear sight. I have a pointed in the right direction. Let me say something about people who die. And you put their name in the paper in the city they live in. That is a flashing yellow light to criminals. Because they know that nobody's probably living there now. And there are a lot of homes that get burglarized. And the good family doesn't know that by putting the name in the paper, it's giving criminals the heads up. So if you're going to do that, Make sure someone's at home. Next letter. Hey Dave, I've been meaning to write you for some time and today I finally find myself having both the time and clarity in my mind to do so. I'm very familiar with your subject matter as I have read all the missing 411 books, watched both of your films, and I've also read your books on Bigfoot Sasquatch. Your work has provided me hundreds of hours of entertainment and perhaps thousands of hours of contemplation and wonder. For this, I can't thank you enough, but thank you. Well, thank you. No, thank you. Well, thank you. Huck says thank you. I would like to share with you my experience with orange orbs. But first, a bit of a background. I'm 38 year old tech support specialist living in Sheffield Lake, Ohio. My home was only a block or so from the shore of Lake Erie. Stop right there. If you live on the shore of a great lake, sir, even a few miles away, start keeping your eyes on the sky. There's all kinds of weird stuff going on out there. My story begins back in August 2007. I have an older brother who is six years older than me and we were very close. On Saturday evening that August, he was out on a boat with a group close of friends near dusk. There were four or five people on board that night and all of them witnessed what my brother described as a UFO. They observed the object heading northwest toward the lake from land. He guessed it to be coming from over Bay Village, a Cleveland suburb about 20 minutes or so east of our home. He described it as an extremely bright orange orb-like object that moves silently in a straight line as much as a commercial airliner would move. He guessed its height in the air to be similar to that of many commercial flights you would see on a daily basis. What made the group take notice of the orb was its brilliant light, which he described as perfectly spherical, and the lack of any flashing lights on the wings, nose, tail, etc. In fact, no wings or tail could be observed. It left no contrail and made no sound on the quiet, picturesque evening. My brother and his friends would soon lose sight of the object, only for it to reappear shortly thereafter in another direction. Knowing that my brother has long held an interest in UFOs, the paranormal, etc., his friends spent the rest of the evening teasing and cajoling him about what they all saw. What was that? They asked. That's your aliens, ha ha, and so on. It wasn't as if he was on the only one to see it, Dave. They all did. So the teasing and joking irked my brother a bit. Understandably, one of them even got some of it on video. Unfortunately, this was 2007 and the camera on that old flip phone was anything but adequate for the task. Still, I was able to watch the video for myself and was amazed to see exactly what my brother had described. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't an airplane or a helicopter. That I'm certain. Fast forward one week. I was visiting my neighbor and I left around dusk to walk across the road and go back home. As fate would have it, I glanced up at the skyline and was floored to see an orange orb heading from east to west along the lake shore. I stayed fixed on it just long enough to convince myself that it wasn't an airplane and then bolted into the house to get my brother as we were living together at the time. Come quick, I yelled. I think your UFO is back. We both stood in my driveway and observed the orb as it continued on its straight, steady path. Now, once did it appear to speed up, slow down, or turn at all. Never did we see any blinking lights or even the slightest hint of an airplane shape. 
It was just perfectly spherical. Bright orange, almost like the setting sun. Honestly, it was beautiful. I wondered at the time how something so bright could be so perfectly round because the light did not twinkle or display any diffraction like you would see from a star or something like that. My brother agreed that this was what he and his friends had witnessed a week earlier. We watched in amazement as it continued west in the direction of Lorraine, Ohio. What happened next was remarkable. The orb, which had been heading west this whole time, a minute or so by my, my estimation, suddenly stopped dead in its tracks. It hovered completely still for a few moments and then dropped something out of the bottom of it. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. I watched in amazement and horror as a bright, blinking Roman candle-like thing fell from the orb down towards the earth. It's a bit embarrassing, really, but I honestly began to run for the garage expecting perhaps a nuclear explosion or something of that nature. In my defense, we have no idea what this was, and I guess my flight or flight mechanism concluded that it was a bomb. I can laugh about it now, but at the time it was terrifying. To my brother's credit, he did not run, and was, and as whatever it dropped fell out of sight behind the tree line, we were further amazed to see that the brilliant bright orange light go out all at once. But here's the thing, Dave. We could still see the object sitting motionless in the sky. It just sat there, perfectly still, dark specked against the grayish backdrop of an oncoming night sky. We observed it for a few minutes before dark was upon us. The object was no longer visible. Now, anyone that knows myself or my brother well have heard this story from someone at, at some point. We aren't guarded about just such things as many people understandably are. So in the fall in 2018, as I stood around my friend's backyard at a campfire, I was a bit caught off guard as my buddy pointed up in the sky behind me. Look, Kevin, what's that? To my amazement, there it was again, 11 years later, this time heading from southwest to the northeast. The sighting was much shorter and as the extensive tree canopy on that block caused us to lose sight of the object after only 15 seconds. Nonetheless, I'm sure what we observed was a similar phenomena to what we saw in 2007. My friends who witnessed it with me always bring it up when we get together. It left an impression on them. <clears throat> this email is already exceeding the length that I intended, but I think you'll find it the last part interesting. November 2019, my brother and I are riding in my car to a local microbrewery in Lorraine. We're on Lake Road US 6 heading west from Sheffield Lake along the lake shore when my brother exclaimed, whoa, what are those lights on the lake? I'm driving the car and we're passing homes, buildings and trees, so it's difficult to see, but sure enough, there was some sort of strange light emitting from lake surface. The sun has already set at this point, so my curiosity peaked and I decided to pull over on the road. This is the Overlook Apartments in the rain. I've attached a uh, description for you. I took this on a relatively modern phone at the time, but it's still a bit difficult to make out. Clearly, there was an orange light emitting from the water and reflecting off what looked like low-hanging patches of clouds or fog. It was strange. We stayed for about five minutes before continuing on our way. In hindsight, I wish we had stayed longer, but honestly, I was beginning to suspect some mundane reason for what we were seeing. And after all, tasty pints of fresh craft beer and good friends awaited us at the brewery. Once we got there, however, I shared the photo with them. Nobody could explain what the heck it was. Many of the patrons owned boats and had grown up on the lake. Nobody could explain it. On the ride home, the lights were gone. Normal, right? Total darkness. When I got home, I uploaded the pic to my computer and studied it more closely. And I was even more convinced that it was something but mundane. <coughs> I appreciate you allowing me to tell a story, Dave. Sorry it was so long. I hope you have a great week. So here's a story for you. A friend of mine, a TV producer, pretty famous, lives in Minnesota. And he had me out at his house, and this was years ago. We were filming a possible trailer for a show. 
And uh, he lives on a really nice lake in Minnesota. And I asked him, I said, you ever seen any strange things out here on this lake? And he looks at his wife and he looks at me and he goes, okay. He goes, two winters ago. He said it was about 10 degrees outside. He said the lake was frozen solid. He said, I'm thinking it was December, January. We wake up the next morning. We look out on the lake. And the lake is probably, you know, the size of about 10 or 15 football fields. It's not a big lake. You see the other side real easily. And he said that there was about 100 of these holes in the ice about the size of a basketball. And he said the pieces of ice were scattered away from the hole, but all of these holes were scattered randomly around the lake. Well, we ended up having this discussion for about half an hour about what could, what could do that. And this, this man's real smart. He said, well, you know, there's underwater submerged objects and maybe they were there and they needed to get out. I asked him if he went down and he looked at the hole. He said, no, I didn't. I probably should have because I would have liked to have seen is if the hole in the ice was perfectly round and if the walls of the ice where the hole came out was smooth or was it something underneath that just punched out? And he said, no, it wasn't punched out. It was like perfectly round. Never heard that before. Maybe you guys have heard it, but that was a first for me. And it was a first for this man who had been around a lot of strangeness in his life. His wife confirmed that it happened. So, okay, Dave, per your request, we are actually talking about you and how much we enjoy the Canine Missing Project. Since uh, the person is a hunter I'm with, I asked if he had a PLB and he said no, but is getting one. And then I just blurted it out, have you ever seen a Bigfoot? After hemming a bit, this guy admitted it. He saw a Bigfoot while driving in Oregon 27 years ago, and his mother saw it too. And you aren't going to fabricate anything with your mom as your witness. They will discuss it blow by blow when I see them at Christmas and perhaps afterwards, if I can convince them to send you a story. Yeah, please do. I'd love to hear it. I can begin to tell you how important your message is. The letters, the commentary on mental health, the absolute strangeness to so many similar missing persons cases, and the need to come to a resolution for families. I tend to look to them as accidents, murder and voluntary, but the majority fall into the category of unknown. Perhaps cosmic. Love the factual news and book reviews. My sympathies on the passing of Ben. I've watched a couple of his YouTube posts. What an engaging young man he is, was. You can use my name if you like. I ordered and received the 11 books. I'm reading it now. I am retired from Sandia National Laboratories with a Q clearance, government contractors to the Department of Energy. Well, that's, a, that's a pretty high and mighty position. Thanks for listening in, and I appreciate it. Next one. Hey Dave, first I'd like to say that I enjoy your videos immensely and watch them whenever I can. I hold you in the highest esteem and have great respect for you and your work. A few weeks ago I watched two videos on YouTube about Nikola Tesla put out by the History Channel. Actually, a director on that project is a good friend of mine and he told me about it. They were talking about the Warden Cliff Tower he built in New York and the intent of transporting energy wirelessly through the air. All that remains of the tower now is an eight-sided foundation. When I hear them say there was a huge block of granite with a large copper rod in every corner, I instantly thought of the granite connection in your missing person stories. They also suggested that the New Yorker hotel where he lived was a match, massive, huge Wardenclyffe towel, tower disguised as a hotel, which also has a massive granite foundation. Somehow I feel the connection here is more than coincidental. May God bless you and your family. You're a role model to many. Thank you. Well, thank you. So, I've done a lot of reading about granite. There's a lot about it that is really different and unusual. And when you think about a massive piece of granite like you see in Yosemite, <clears throat> that, have, that would must have much more power 
than even we can understand. So, those are the letters. I keep. I appreciate them. I appreciate your stories. Keep writing them. You can write to me at Dave Politis. Correct that. You can write to me at Can-Am, like Canadian American, Can-Am Missing at Yahoo.com. I told you I read every one. And uh, the ones today, I appreciated them a lot because they were well written. They had paragraphs. You, you used uh, word check, punctuation check. Thank you. <laughs> so, first story tonight is from Missing 411 Law. It involves a young man named James McCammond, 19 years old, went missing October 5th, 1941, just outside of Rennie, Manitoba, which is in the area of many missing persons cases. And when you look at a map of Rennie, you will see that there's water everywhere. The McCammon family owned and lived owned a house and lived in Winnipeg, and they had a summer home in Brereton, B-R-E-R-E-T-O-N, Brereton Lake, near the town of Rennie. The area was described as wet, marshy, and on the White Shell Reserve. Now, for 1941, James had a great, great future. He was an apprentice for the Canadian Railroad and was going to school for that. And in 1941, that was one great job. Anyhow, he invited uh, four of his classmates to ride with him 90 minutes from where they were going to school in Winnipeg to their cabin. And they were going to go duck hunting for the weekend. This is James. Smart, smart young man, outdoorsman, loved the outdoors. His friends and family said he was an experienced hunter and knew the area around the cabin like you know your backyard. He carried a 22 caliber rifle. So on October 5th, the group from the railroad decided to drive the roads looking for ducks because they had spent one night at the cabin. At 10 a.m., they had been driving around and they stopped at what looked like the promising location. The group agreed to spend 30 minutes out looking and then meet back at the car. Everyone split out, went out alone. Everyone came back to the car except James. Friends searched, they looked all around, they couldn't find anything. And finally, at the end of the day, they found a local ranger and reported James McCammon missing. Let me give you a feeling for where this is at. So this is the lake. This is the city I told you about, Rennie, Manitoba. So the cabin was on the lake area. This is Winnipeg, where the school was at and where the folks had the cabin. It was about a 90-minute ride out to the area. And everything east of this location is nothing but water, marshy, ideal place to go missing in my mind. Now, James, being 19 years old, smart young man, folks had no worries about him going out alone hunting. And they made that blatantly clear. And just because the other group went out alone and nobody was with him, it didn't raise any fear in their minds. But after the ranger was notified, the ranger notified the McCammon family in Winnipeg, and soon they were all out there looking. So the railroad heard about this, and they suspended all classes and sent all of the students out to Rennie to help in the search for James. The ranger called the Southern Saskatchewan Military Regiment for assistance called the RCMP. Well, the military dispatched 100 soldiers, two teams of dogs, a helicopter, and a plane. The railroad got every passing train that got anywhere near Rennie to blow its signal horn off and on the entire time. The thought being that if somebody was lost in the marsh, 
they would know that the train was in that direction where the sound was, and they would walk towards it. At the time, in 1941, this was known as the largest search and rescue in any province in Manitoba. It was overwhelmed the town with planes, helicopters, hundreds on the ground, dogs, trains. The center of the search was the White Shell Reserve and White Shell Road. Well, the newspapers at the time made an important point that while the search was going on, searchers were dealt with sub-freezing temperatures, rain and snow, and it was miserable. The RCMP was in charge of the search, and they were getting pressure from the family and friends of James and the railroad to find their student. Military teams covered hundreds, maybe thousands of acres in their effort to find him. The weird part of this, they found nothing. But this is in a cluster of missing people. There were other searches after this, but the, the first one and the most comprehensive lasted seven days. As I was doing the research on this story, first of all, when I grew up, my folks had a house. It was a cabin in Lake Tahoe, and uh, they owned it with another family. We went up there a lot, winter and summer. And I thought, how could I own a cabin if I knew one of my kids disappeared there? I don't think I could. And I thought about the McCammon family. How could they ever enjoy their cabin again knowing that their son was out there somewhere? How could you detract your mind enough to not go out and search for your son knowing that he was never found? I couldn't do it. And maybe, maybe there are families that could, but I couldn't do it. James McCammon was never found. It's not normal. His family was perplexed and depressed for years. Next story. Regarding a, a man named Keith Haggard, 55 years old, went missing April 24th, 1987 at about 5 p.m. in the Pecos Wilderness of New Mexico. Now, the location where he disappeared is right in the middle of a cluster I've written about many times in the past outside of Santa Fe. And I'll show you where this is. Spent a lot of time in this area over the years filming. In Missing 411 The Hunted, we did an entire segment about this area. So this region on this road coming up uh, near Lake Peak, this is the Santa Fe ski area. Some very, very strange disappearances have happened there over the years that I've written about. Elk Mountain has several disappearances I've written about over the years. Well, right in between the two, there's a place called the Holy Ghost Campground, and that's where this search and rec rescue occurred. This is Santa Fe Baldy, Santa Fe. The ride up to the ski resort, easy drive. It's beautiful. I encourage you to do it. And one of the disappearances that happened there happened during the summer when a family was having a picnic at the ski resort. Very strange. Whoops. Now that, I can't even blame that on Huck. That was stupid old me. Sorry. So, Keith decided that he was going to go for a day hike. He had gone to this location many times in the past. And... He'd been married to 15 years to his wife. He liked to hike alone. He was a geologist and a prospector in the Northwest Territories of Canada, an area that was ultra rugged, brutal weather. He was a really inexperienced person in the outdoors. At the time, he was an assistant director for the Solar Energy Institute in Golden, Colorado. Oh, Golden, Colorado. This is quite a coincidence. January 10th, 
I encourage you to go to the Sasquatch Outpost website and we are going to have a huge event there uh, on the 8th and 9th or is it the 9th and the 10th? I think it's the 8th, 9th and 10th and uh, there's going to be some special things going on and if you look at the Sasquatch Outpost you live anywhere in Colorado or close by and you can get there. Epic event. Epic. So, uh, I'm sorry I got detracted on that. He was a part-time professor at the College of Santa Fe. He liked teaching. He was 55 years old. He uh, told his wife that he was going to go out. He'd be back by the end of the day. He went on a trail that he had been to many, many times in the past. Well, on April 24th, 1987, he drove his Volvo up to the Pecos Wilderness, got off at the Holy Ghost campground, parked the car, got out some walking sticks, took a bottle canteen, and started to walk up the trail. <clears throat> he didn't come back that night. His wife calls the sheriff. Sheriff gets out to the campsite at 11 o'clock and there's Keith's Volvo parked exactly where everyone thought it'd be. Well, the sheriff puts together and contacts the New Mexico State Police because they are really the ones that are in charge of all search and rescues in New Mexico. And I got to tell you, they are hardly professional and do one heck of a good job. So on April 25th, early in the morning, the search and rescue starts. And they got 50 volunteers on site, tracking dogs, New Mexico State Police Hilo, an airplane. All searched the Holy Ghost Canyon. And the efforts concentrated on the stream in the canyon. And they went up three miles. Didn't find anything. Canines didn't pick up a cent. Second day, they went up 1.3 miles from the campground. Here's the campground. They just went up a little bit into the canyon. 1.3 miles. That's not very far at all. And they found Keith's body in a small creek face up. Now why is that important? Now, someone who's studied drowning extensively, the vast, 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 overwhelming number of males that are found in water deceased are found face down. Face up is super unreal and unusual. But there was Keith face up in the water. The body had some bruising on it, and he didn't have shoes on. They couldn't find his canteen, his walking sticks, or his wallet. They were all missing. They pulled him from the water, and they turned him over to the New Mexico State Coroner. Articles in the paper said that there was nothing that pointed to foul play except the unusual circumstances of the, of the body being found, which they described as highly unusual. The articles continued to hammer the point home that the coroner wasn't coming up with the cause of death. On the fourth day after the autopsy, they came out and said that Keith died of exposure to cold. Doesn't make any sense. Because during the day, the weather in the area was in the mid-70s. Now at night it got cold, but there would be no reason for Keith to be out at night. So a regular hiker in this area, he had hiked it dozens of times, very experienced, and he's found face up in water without his shoes. They didn't find his shoes. Corner ruled he didn't have a heart attack. There was no animal predation or a human crime. And they couldn't explain the bruising or say much more about the bruising. 
There was never any mention of any head trauma. Now, the only other time I've ever had a case even close to this was also in the Pecos Wilderness. It involved an older lady who went hiking with her husband. This is, I've written about this case <laughs> lengthy in my books. And I think I've even done a uh, video about it. But the woman got separated from her husband. They searched for over a week. They found her later in a creek, curled up in a fetal position, dead and naked. That's an older woman. Her mouth was not in the water. They said she drowned. It doesn't make any sense because the creek was about five inches deep. It was a very confusing case, very, as is this case. Uh, why would Keith die of exposure when he could have gotten up and just followed the trail down that was right next to the creek? makes no sense. But if you go back and you remember my other videos that I've talked about, a lot of times I do believe that GHB is one of the issues on many of these cases. Somehow or another the body gets GH GHB ingested, somehow they, in they end up in the water. Water can drop your body temperature down quickly and when you have GHB you can't get out of the water so if the coroners don't test for GHB, which none of them do, then the cause of death is going to be exposure. Now, why don't they test for GHB? I've been asked to talk at coroner conferences before and explain this phenomenon, but the conference wouldn't let me talk. Why? I don't know. Maybe I'm not educated enough to speak in front of them. Who knows? But Keith Haggard's case is very, very odd. Because the other case that almost mimicked this occurred very close by. And I haven't seen another case like it since. So the next case. A very recent incident happened October 10th of this year in Alaska. Before I get going very deep into this case, many of you know that I've talked about hikers, hunters, that seem to fall when they're alone. And the falls don't make sense. Circumstances don't make sense. And the case has just dropped. Well, in the movie, Missing 411 The Hunted, you're going to see something in that movie that will change your perception of this issue for the rest of your life. I guarantee it. So, this next case involves a man named Ryan Rush, R-U-E-S-C-H, 47 years old. He was born in Medford, Wisconsin. In 2003, he moved to Juneau. And at the time, he had a technical degree in aircraft maintenance. And he got employed by uh, Tamsco Helicopters. He did that for a number of years. And in 2008, he moved to Fairbanks, where he had met somebody and got married. And recently, he was working on Chinook Helicopters at Fort Wainwright, Alaska. His wife and his two twin-year-old nine boys. When I heard that, I got a tear in my eye. So he's living in Fairbanks. On October 10th, he and a friend decided they were going to go hunting uh, outside of Sitka on an area called Lake Diana. It gets very remote very quickly around Sitka. Trust me on this one. Sitka is an absolutely beautiful city in Alaska. I encourage you to get there someday. Well, they had to make their way to Lake Diana down here. And distance-wise, it wasn't very far, but driving-wise, quite a distance. And very, very remote. Lots of big game in that area. 
This is uh, Ryan. So when he was hunting with his friend, this is going to be a story you have heard so many times. And here we go again. October 10th, he goes hunting with his friend, and somehow they got separated. How many times have you heard that from me? Well, at the end of the day, his friend goes, gets back to the car. Ryan isn't there. So that night, his friend gets a hold of uh, wildlife troopers, Alaska State troopers. Eventually, at 8 a.m., the wildlife troopers notify their platoon. The platoon leader calls the U.S. Coast Guard in Sitka, and they dispatch a helicopter to search the area for Ryan. Maybe they could see him in a clearing or I don't know what the thought pattern was. But eventually they're flying over an area and they see the body at the bottom of a 300 foot cliff. The helicopter drops one of the people on the helo down, recovers the body. They fly him to Sitka and he's determined by paramedics to be deceased. Why do I tell you this? Because that scenario has played itself out hundreds of times. And every time, it's like they flush the toilet, case is over, he made a mistake, he died. I've never believed that, I'm sorry. I know because I've been in that situation where I got separated from my friends, namely, most of the time it's fishing. And, and I could tell you, villagers, that when I'm alone, and I'm walking through the woods, I'm very cautious. If I'm off trail, I'm very cautious about where I'm walking. I'm not going to walk off a cliff. I'm not going to walk into danger. And if I'm anywhere near a trail, I'm going to stay on it. So in this case, they're hunting right around Lake Diana. They're right around water. Yeah, point of separation. He was a hunter, he's a subgroup. I wanted to know what he was wearing or not wearing when he was found, but I never heard. Never heard if they found the firearm. Felt very, very sorry for his wife and kids. Boys aren't gonna have a dad at a prime time in life. There was a fundraiser back in October for them. If it was still active, I would tell you about it, but it's not. Uh, I don't, I don't find any fault with Ryan in doing what he did. Men got to go out just like women got to go out and do their sports and have fun. And I saw a picture online of Ryan, his wife and his boys. They were halibut fishing. My gosh. I'm sure the boys are going to have great memories of their dad. So my view on life has changed a lot since making this latest movie and just knowing what I know. It's critically important that you carry a personal locator beacon, you carry a sat phone, and you stay together when possible. When I was reading about this story, I, I thought, man, if Ryan just would have had personal locator beacon, activated it, sat down, and don't move. That helo from Sitka, that Coast Guard helo, could have found him. Because when your personal locator beacon goes off, the coordinates are sent to the National Oceanographic Admi Administration. And they send it to the closest search and rescue, the coordinates, GPS coordinates. And all the search helicopters have GPS on them they would have flown right to Ryan. So when I say that the best Christmas gift you could give anybody is a GPS, a personal locator beacon, I'm not kidding you. Second best is a sat phone, but there's a monthly fee with that and that gets kind of expensive. So rather than getting a new rifle, new scope, more bullets, better clothing, 
get the PLB. Nobody I talk about ever thought they'd need it. Yeah, you don't need that kind of stuff. That's not going to happen to me. But friends, I tell you always about five or six cases every week where somebody doesn't come back. So those are the three cases for today. I appreciate you being here. I really wish that all of you would pass these videos along to others so that they could understand that this can happen to them because it does happen to people on a regular basis. No matter how safe you are, some things it, it appears you just can't avoid. So from Huck and me, hope you have a great week. This is the giving season. Give of yourself. Be nice. If you have a local rescue mission, go buy an extra turkey and drop it off. Make somebody really happy. Have a great week. Politis out. <laughs>